But I've got something to cheer you up. I got to find how to restart my. Uh, here we go. All right, start my little computer. These are called brain cramps. <laughs> I love these are good. You're gonna like these. These were sent to me six years ago. I'm gonna get to use them. Yeah, you know what brain cramp is? Oh, turn the light off. Okay. That's when you can't think of something. You just say something. Your mouth doesn't know what your brain's trying to tell it. <laughs> This is funny. This is 1994 Miss Alabama, uh, Miss Alabama USA contest. The question is, if you could live forever, would you and why? Her answer, I would not live forever because if we should live forever, wait, I would not live forever because we should not live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, then we would live forever. But we cannot live together forever. That's why I will not like to live forever. That's going to be a potential Miss USA. She could run for Congress. All right. Brooke Shields. Smoking kills. If you're killed, you've lost a very important part of your life. <laughs> These are true statements. I'm trying to find a place for this thing. I'm not going to get my popping sound. All right. This is from a uh, university professor. It says, uh, I'm sorry, University of Kentucky basketball forward. I've never had knee surgery, on major knee surgery on any other part of my body. <laughs> oh, man, I got so many. Uh, this one here. I'm just going to give it so you can guess who it is. I'm not going to have some reporters crawling through our papers. We are the president. Hillary Clinton. <laughs> we are the president. <laughs> here we go. Half of this game is 90% mental. <laughs> yeah, you had to think about that, huh? That was the manager of the Phillies baseball team. Here's here's one. If you can guess who said this, it isn't air pollute. It isn't pollution that's harming the environment. It's the impurities in our air and the water that are doing it. That was Al Gore. That was Al Gore. He's got he's got another one here. We are ready. For an unforeseen event that may or may not occur. <laughs> you can't be wrong there. It's an unforeseen event and it may and it may not happen. Lee Iacocca. This is during the time we're trying to get clean air. We have we've got to pause and ask ourselves, how much clean air do we need? <laughs> There's a couple more. There's a couple more. I'm gonna end with just these two. Oh, here's another one. I like this one. This is from a, a US reporter reporting with information coming out of Australia. Traditionally, most of Australia's imports come from overseas. <laughs> it's another country. <clears throat> All right, here we go. The last two. These are my favorite. I'm saving these two for last. If somebody has a bad heart, they can plug in this jack in at night, and as they go to bed, they will monitor their heart throughout the night, and the next morning when they wake up dead, there will be a record. That was the chairman of the FCC. When they wake up dead. All right. All right. Here's the final one. This is gonna. This one. I, I, I saved this class. Your food stamps will be stopped effectively March 1992 because we received notice that you passed away. May God bless you. He says you may reapply if there's a change in your circumstances. <laughs> Department of Social Sur Services, Greenville, South Carolina. They sent a letter to a dead person and said, if you got better, let us know. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Turn to uh, Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to talk about a subject. This is going to be a Bible study style, so I'll probably have a little more reading than I normally would. But I want to give us a, a, an idea of something that people take for granted. In fact, if the world... If uh, mainstream Christianity would simply look at this concept, there's no way they could ever gather, get get to the point of a, an understanding of heaven and hell. I want to talk about the land. Now, Satan knows how important God's plan is developing with the land. And look in Genesis chapter 1. It says this, And the earth became, in the words instead of was, actually should be translated became. The earth became without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. 
from the time we pick up in Genesis, we're finding a recreation of this planet. Every single thing on it had been utterly destroyed. It became completely without form. In other words, as land masses and what was coming, it wasn't even recognizable at that point. Satan knew God's plan from the beginning. He was jealous, as we see that in Ezekiel uh, 28 and Isaiah 14, how God it shows us about Satan's desire to have Jesus Christ's throne, the job that he had, and how he was trying to bring it to an utter, uh, uh, I don't know, just, just utter void of what we see here in Genesis. And actually it became that way. So what I'm going to talk about today is the land. Like we here in America, is the, the ultimate dream is to own your own home. In fact, right now we're at the, we're at the beginning stages of, a, of another major meltdown of homes being repossessed. The, the, uh, the figures, I don't have them in front of me, but they're actually absolutely staggering. So what we've looked, we've looked at from the, uh, the mid-90s, 95, 97, when they began to change the laws to force banks and lending institutes to force them to lend to those who really can't afford it and put them in housing that they can't afford to pay. Well, it all began to melt down about three or four years ago. And so we're beginning to see that meltdown continuing on through today so that the American dream, the home, uh, the right to own a piece of land is finally just leaving in many, many cases. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands, millions of homes right now that they actually have people who are upside down, who can't pay for the houses, but the banks have nowhere to put them, so they're leaving them in there right now until they can figure out what to do with the mess that's going on. They're trying to find a way to come up with, with hundreds of millions and billions of dollars more to try to stop it, but there really isn't any way to do it. I've got a statement here. Let me read this, and I'll go into the actual uh, sermon. I wrote here, it said, Our future heritage lies in the promise of the land. Now, I don't know how much people really actually looked at a simple concept like the land and how important it was. Because, see, Jesus is the, he's coming back to restore. He said he's going to restore all things. He's got to put it back into the condition it was when the Father put it in his hands for him to build everything and create it, in which we understand that all things created by him. So it has to be put back in a perfect state to be given back to the Father, ultimately. Now, most of you here have been in church for a long, long time, so you understand that there is a new heaven and a new earth coming. This one cannot pass until it's put back to the rightful owner in the condition it was that when he received it. So we need to understand that. It cannot go back with impurities. It has to go back perfect. It can't have anything wrong with it, so it's going to take some time for that rebuilding process to take place. Satan knew it, and that's why his hand is in to destroy everything there is of the land. So we see God's plan through this. So let me go on and re read out what I, said, what I wrote. It says, And in that promise we find that God has given laws that point us in the ways of peace and ultimately deliver us to freedom, complete freedom, never again to be brought under bondage of sin or death anymore. It is God's law that governs the land that we find the ultimate in the place of in the plan of salvation through the land. So I want to take us through today as a little study on God's plan in salvation which centers around land, which we sometimes just take for granted. And if we're not a farmer, and most of us here are not farmers, now, for example, Jerry Nicholas, he grows year-round. Jerry Nicholas understands what it takes to grow things. In fact, he's, he's probably got his little greenhouses going now, getting ready for the spring and, and being able to plant his own seeds and mix his own little peat pots. But if we're growing up in the city, the most we ever think about land and growing is we go to the grocery store and pick up whatever it is we need. Because we're not, we're not living in an area that, that's agricultural. People out in the Midwest, they may feel a little differently and they think about the land in a little different way. Now, let's go just a few chapters over to, to Genesis chapter 4. We know that Adam and Eve sinned, and they were put out of the garden. But now we see something different take place with this sin of Cain slewing Abel. It's in Genesis chapter 4, verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass that when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. The Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, uh, I know not, and am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? 
the voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. Now, I've, I've talked about this before, is that, is that the land can't actually speak, but actually it does in ways that we never understand. Because I used the example of the acacia tree, where the acacia tree, if there was a, a giraffe chewing on the leaves of the acacia tree, the rest of the tree leaves, they close them up. And they send out poisons to stop it from being eaten on. That's a natural thing that this tree actually does. The interesting thing about that is not just the tree itself, because we can, well, we can understand that. But any tree within the surrounding area that can pick up whatever that tree sends out, those trees also do the same thing. They're not even being touched. But they're around within, within reach, whatever that reach is. And those trees begin to do the same thing. And so when we look at this, what we're looking at is a land that was created perfectly is now the life that was in that man's blood is now poured out into the ground and the ground has just received its first impurity. The blood didn't belong there. And so was there microorganisms in it that actually reacted in such a way that sent out something to, the, to God? Because it says, your blood cries out from the ground. It's an interesting thought, just something that probably can never be proven, at least in this lifetime, and maybe some scientists might be able to. But the way it's written, I think it's more than just poetic. I see y'all might be getting a little warm. You might turn that heater off and maybe put the AC on for just a few minutes, because I can feel the warmth up here too. With these lights on, it feels pretty hot. Now, here's the point I want to I want to make right now. Verse 12. It says, And when you till the ground... It shall not yield unto you its strength. So from that time on, from that impurity that just entered into that soil, God placed a curse on that land that it would never again, until Jesus restores it completely, yield its full strength. Now we can get an idea of what the potential might be when we look forward, and I'm not going to turn there, you know the story of the promised land, when they sent the spies in, and they came back, remember all the stuff that they found? Took two men on a stave carrying on their shoulder. And, and the Bible's telling us it's not yielding its strength yet. But two men to carry one cluster of grapes. Imagine having an orchard and what could possibly be produced if the land was turned around. I know I've tried in my backyard. I've, I've told, I've did sermons about the, my soil in my backyard. You're laughing already just thinking about it, huh? My first year, I came up here and I put, I put fruit up here. I went, and I went and bought this thing at the store. It was beautiful. Then I put what I brought up. It was about that big, a squash. You know, and there's this big old squash next to it. That's all the land produced in my backyard with fertilizer. I had to go back and rebuild that soil and, and put nutrient in it. And I remember going over and getting horse manure and hay and sawdust and just throwing everything in there. I had flies and roaches. and It was a mess. But little by little, it kept coming back. And each year, I got a little better. And by the third year of working on it, I remember one tomato plant that had over 200 tomatoes on it. One plant. And I tried to do as much as I could naturally. There was one time I had these buckets in my backyard, just growing them in buckets. And I tried different ways and different fertilizers. And each one was doing differently. And I come home from work one day, and they were all doing fine. The next morning, I go out there and take a look. And his caterpillars got it. All I had was nubs. Everything eaten down to nubs. I don't know if you ever seen these. I think they call them horn worm or horn caterpillars. And they got these, they're big and green. They got a little horn on the tail of them. And about halfway up, it sits up. It's got the back leg grab onto it, but it sits up with a bunch of legs, and it walks from leaf to leaf. And it'll start with one leaf, and it's like a typewriter. And I watched it go right like this until the leaf was gone. Then the hands would move over to the next leaf, and it was just like a typewriter go right there. It never stopped. It was an eating machine, like a land shark. And it just went through it over during the night, and I didn't know it, ate up everything I had out there. Now, I think some of that is because of the uh, some of the curses of the land that we have today. But here's what I want to get to, is that the land is it's got a curse on it. It doesn't produce what it's supposed to, and there's going to be a struggle and what else is included? Thorns, thistles, 
And so we now begin to see the change of the land that's taken place. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12 now and let's pick up the story of the inheritance. We see that the land is always in the middle of whenever God talks about your inheritance, it's talking about land also, including your inheritance. So, so we need to consider that when we talk about our inheritance because we just that just goes over people's heads. And when you look at the final picture of the new heaven and new earth coming, it's going to miss all those people that are supposed to be in heaven. If just one person in a Protestant church, or a Catholic church for that matter, if just one person would say, well, why is God bringing that here if they're all going to be in heaven? That don't make any sense. It would begin to open their mind to saying, wait a minute, maybe somebody's not telling me the truth here. You see what I mean? Is that we've we got to look at the basics of what God says. Genesis chapter 12, I'll begin reading verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, to get you out of your country from your kindred and, your, and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. It says, I'll make of you a great nation. It goes on in verse 4, says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old, and he departed from Haran. Now we know he's really wealthy by this time that he spent, and Lot's coming with him. You know the story that comes up later with, with his uh, nephew Lot. They, they got so much when they come to where God's telling them to go. Eventually, he says, we can't live together because we got just too much cattle. It's going to consume the land, so they begin to separate. Let's pick up the story where we're at right now, though, in verse 10. There's a famine in the land, so Abram gets, he gets down from Egypt, and he sojourns there, for the famine was grievous in the land. So it comes to pass that when he came near to Egypt, now we know the story he's telling Sarah that he's going to be his, his sister, uh, actually, I, I really don't want that part of the story. Let's pick it up in verse 14. So it come to pass that when Abram was coming to Egypt, that the Egyptian beheld the woman. She was very fair. The princes and the Pharaoh saw her, and he commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. I'm in the... Uh, yeah, I'm, in, I'm in, the, in the right... Actually, that's not even where I want to be. I'm sorry. That's why it isn't making any sense. Let's... Let's go to, uh, let's jump from here where we were in Genesis chapter 12. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I had a different chapter written down for something else. Let's, all right, let's go back where we were in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, by going to the land, right? He's promising to go to the land. Save your spot in Genesis. We're going to come back there in a little bit. Go to Hebrews. Let's put a connection together. Let's go to Hebrews. Right, here's, here's what I wanted to make the story. Hebrews chapter 11. God tells Abram, get you from your family, go to the land that I'm telling you. We know the story, he goes to the land, right? He sees the land, he's in the land. There's no doubt about it, where, where they're at. Hebrews 11, verse 8. But look, what, look what's being said now, verse 8. By faith Abraham, that when he was called to go out into a place where he should go, should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing where he went. By faith he so journeyed to the land of promise, as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him in the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker was God. God takes him to a land. This is the promised land. Now the Bible is saying that the city he was looking for is not there. He goes on to say, says, through faith also Sarah and herself received strength to conceive the seed, deliver the child. Verse 12, that sprang even one from him is looked as good as dead, and as many as the stars of heaven were multiplied, as the sand of the sea by the seashore. Verse 13, all these died in faith, not having received the promises, but have seen them from afar off. So here we see the story of Abraham promised the land. I want you to go to the land for your inheritance. He goes to the land of the inheritance. He's in the land of inheritance. And it's not there. Now, what was interesting about this is that it now shifted from the land to a city. So, well, why was God doing that? Why did God shift from the land to the city? I want you to do this if you get a chance. When you go home, you look at the size of the new Jerusalem. I, what I've done here is I just printed out here a scale model of what we're looking at the Middle East and what was promised to Abraham. And it tells him about, and you'll see the boundaries that God says from 
from Egypt, which goes across and gets the north, the south, to the rivers, to the to the east. And then I did this. I took the sizes as best as the the experts tell us, and I wrote it as, and I put a little block of the new Jerusalem coming down. And when I did an overlay, and you can do this at home, you will see that the new Jerusalem covers almost 100% or even actually a little bit over the borders of the land that God told Abraham to go to. Alright? So what God was telling him is that I want you to go to this land. Later on, he tells Isaac and Jacob, he tells the Israelites, this is going to be your land from this area to this area, from this area to this area. Then we look for the city that we just read that wasn't there yet. So God brought them to the land where the city is going to be. And so what the Bible is telling us in the New Testament is that they were in the land looking forward to the time that the new Jerusalem would come and encompass that same area. All right? But if you don't put the two together, you, begin to, you, you don't see the connection. Satan knew what God's plan was eventually to have this new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, where everyone's going to come to. And by the way, I think it says it's, if my memory can serve me correctly, about 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles by 1,200 miles. That's a big area. Imagine you say, we're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. Yeah, but if you're in this corner on the southeast, you may never see the guy in the northeast corner over 12, because they're going to cut Caddy Corner across, and it's 1,200 across. It might be 15, 1,600 miles across. Another interesting thing is if you drew this, the distances, it encompasses most of the eastern part of the United States. It's interesting. You just take that square and just move it around it planet, you know, see what, what goes where. And you see some interesting parallels. In fact, some of the some of the area that looks the same is very much like certain parts of the United States as you look over there. And there's got to be some kind of duality there. I don't know if there is, but it looks like it. It's going to be an interesting study as we go down the line. But I wanted to bring that out about the land, looking forward, because you see, you and I are in a promised land, promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, through the blessings that was eventually given through Joseph and his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and we are in that land today. You look around, you don't see it. So what are we looking for? The same thing. We're looking for that city from afar off, aren't we? We're looking for the land yet because just like with Abraham, these all died in faith, never having received the promises. But he's seen them from afar off. Now, isn't that what we do? Now, something came to me last week while we were in Tallahassee with the, with the leadership. But one of the gentlemen was doing his class. In my mind, I've always said, man, I can't wait to be able to ask, you fill in the blank, Abraham, Noah. Man, just sit down and talk with them what it would be like in their day. What do you think they're going to want to do? They're going to come to you and I hopeful in our prom waiting for our promises, and they'll tell us what they were waiting for and what they saw. You don't think they're going to want to know what was it like in your generation? You were the end time generation. It says, the kings and priests desired to know what you know. And they'll say, tell us what you knew. It won't be interesting to be able to share from our perspective how God worked with us during that same time in that promised land that's yet to come. So when you see this, they always, never having seen it, but seen it from afar off, were fully persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. They eventually, even when God brought them to that promised land, they realized that this is not the goal. And that's where you and I need to understand. The land that you and I have, our inheritance, that's not what we're in the middle of today. That's not what we strive every day to overcome. It's what God's going to give us in the future coming down. And then all this time, we're in that training ground, hoping to obtain that inheritance. And if we think that we can hold on to what we've got today, that that's going to help us, we kid ourselves. We've got to look to that, not to today. And be willing to let things go in the past. And I talk to people who a lot who 
lost jobs, who had things going for them. It's like, man, I was making a lot of money. And they can't let it go to go forward. Until you can let go anything that holds you back from following God, you're going to have a hard time. Because it's going to get worse, it won't get better. And we'll have to go through a lot of things before Christ returns. Let's go back now to... Uh, Gen Let's go to, to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 12. Let's go to Jeremiah 12, chapter 12. Again, when I were talking about the land, Jeremiah chapter 12, I'm going to start reading in verse 1. I'm going to cover a lot of these scriptures, and you put them together when you go home. Keep them all together and put a little study in your book. You might want to draw a little thing, one thing to the next. You know, you sometimes will do that and keep yourself a study going on. Gen Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 1 says, righteous, uh, righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead with you, yet let me talk with you in your judgments. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? And we do that. See, when we look around at the news, and like everybody who does evil seems like they get ahead. And that, you know, that's not going to change. they got a force going for them. they got Satan who's going to move things in their direction to make it seem like it's going to be beneficial to be evil rather than to do good. Verse 2 it says, You have planted them, yea, they have taken root, and they grow, yea, they bring forth fruit, and are you near in their mouth and forth from their heart. In other words, they'll get out there, even he's talking about even people who pretend to be religious, says, Oh yeah, God's real close to me, God did this, God did that. And in fact, he says, You're not anywhere near you at their heart, it's only in their mouth. It says in verse 4, How long shall the land mourn? How long shall the land mourn? You think from the time that God says the land shall no longer yield its increase, the land began to mourn? When, when God's creation doesn't do what it's intended to do, do you think there's a problem? I think so. You look at animals, the way they react. You look at the birds. Everything that's been created is done for a certain thing. When it doesn't do what it's supposed to, it acts poorly. The New Testament tells us all creation waits for that adoption. All creation, that means everything that's living waits for that time when it's put back to its rightful state. I know it doesn't have a mind like we do. I mean, I understand that. But it's designed, nature's designed to react a certain way. When it doesn't do it, you will see that they will try to find ways. Take a tree, cut it down a little bit, and try to stop it from growing. It will work its way around. They will, they, they will train trees now. They know it's supposed to grow up and it won't grow up. They stop it. It hinders it. What does it do? It finds ways to get around. It will meander around bushes, fences. Uh, you ever see it grow around a fence? It's like it grows all the way around the fence and compasses. And before you know it, you don't even see the fence anymore. It's going to do what it's supposed to do. If It's shown that through man, if they take man away from any given city over a period of time, the land will take back over its land. It will. It can't grow through cement, but what it does is it grows around it, begins to decay, puts leaves on top of it, begins its own mulch. Next thing you know, it's growing from the top of the cement and disappears. The land will always go back to the land unless man stops it. It's designed to do that. And here it says, How long shall the land mourn? Just to, again, I'm just putting thoughts in your head just to go through and think about it. All right, let's pick up the story, same chapter, verse 10. Many shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. Now it's talking this in duality here because we're talking about land and we're talking about his people, his vineyard. Because we see in Isaiah, it talks about the vineyard is my people, Israel. It says, the shepherds have destroyed my vineyard. They have trampled my portion underfoot. They have made my pleasant portion their desolate wilderness. So God begins to talk about people in relationship to land. That if you don't nurture the people, you don't take care of them like you're supposed to, it becomes desolate like the land. So every year, the land becomes more and more desolate. I was looking at something this morning. I don't know if I brought it. Oh, here we go. It was interesting. I was looking at the land. Man, they got some strange stuff out there that people have concepts about the land. And now I see where all these movies come from. I didn't know that till today. You see all these movies, like these comments coming down. This is human extinction. 
<laughs> human extinction. Future scenarios to future extinction. We've got um, meteorite impacts. Now, I don't know how they figured this out, but this is, this is what was written out. In 1.4 million years from now, the store Delessi 7110 is expected to cause an increase in meteoroids. 1.4 million years from now, do you know this? Think about that. How are you going to know that? And these meteorites will cause a large number of comets from the cloud, ORT, to impact the Earth. Now, these are scientists telling us this. So we see these movies about these meteorites coming to the Earth. Another way we're going to lose uh, the Earth is cosmic threats. Global pandemics, for example, HIV and viruses. Uh, mega tsunamis. So how's the mega tsunami going to destroy the entire Earth? Well, they got that the mega tsunami is going to hit the whole East Coast. And through the East Coast will create whatever disruption in the planet, which is going to melt the Antarctic ice cap, flood the Earth, and just wipe us all out. Yeah, you're looking kind of funny like I did when I was reading this this morning. <laughs> now, this is true. These are all things that are going to wipe out the Earth. Climate change. I love this. Global warming, and right below it, a new ice age. These, these are the scientists, that both of them. It's like one saying global warming is going to destroy us, the other saying a new ice age is going to destroy us. Right behind each other. World population and agricultural crisis. Super volcanoes. Artificial intelligence. Well, that's interesting. Um, artificial intelligence. We've got a lot of that going on in Washington right now. <laughs> Climate change, ecology, nuclear war, which has got a real possibility somewhere down the road. Now, this was a new one I hadn't heard of. A cataclysmic pole shift. Cataclysmic, either North Pole or South Pole, will, be, will shift, which would create earthquakes, create tsunamis, change the climate, and destroy us all. So it, it, it encapsulates a whole bunch of them. Now, Matthew 24 tells us one thing about the land, that unless God cuts time short, no flesh is going to be saved. But you know what they don't have on here? Human sinning and repenting. <laughs> and human humans themselves destroying themselves for whatever their reasons are. So I just wanted to look at that when I looked at all this stuff with the land and see what was going on. But you might find it quite interesting when you go look through and see all the different scenarios that they have here. Now let's pick it up in, in verse uh, 13. It says, They sow their wheat, and they shall have reaped thorns. They have put themselves to pain, but they shall not profit. They shall be ashamed of the venues because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Talking about the land, how God's going to bring about the pain. Verse 14. Thus says the Lord against... All mine evil neighbors that touch the inheritance which I have caused my people, that touch the inheritance. What do you think is going on with all these uh, the environmentalists and the changes in the seeds that they're growing? I don't know. I don't know if you know this, like the hybrid seeds. They can't use the hybrid seeds to grow all the seeds off of. Where it used to be, you would grow your seeds, and I and I've talked to Jerry about this. He keeps his own seeds, by the way, and he he grows his own seeds and he'll save the seeds. Your hybrid seeds won't produce more plants produce fruit. So all these things that they're doing now to help produce food to feed everybody in the populations is counterproductive, including, for a better term, raping the land with insecticides and its poisons. And I've done that when I was out on the farm. I said, I'm going to grow, I'm going to you know, come into the church and do what, it, you know, what looks right. I remember growing a land, some land, some with the fertilizing poisons to protect the plants, and some, this is going to be my natural planting. It was so sick looking. The bugs had a field day. It said, well, you plant companion crops. Well, I'll plant a companion crop. They got along real good with the bugs. I didn't realize that's what they meant. Is that I would plant marigolds in a certain plant and it's hoped to keep the bugs off of it. But it didn't do anything. And I realized real shortly that because of the land, if I didn't put herbicides to protect the bugs, I'm not going to eat. And so here we are out there spraying the fields with the with plain loads of, of pesticides on the land. We'll come to what's called the land rest. 
There's no formula unless his rest is land when he's growing. Not for the money. He's, so the land never rests. He goes on to say, um, he says, that touch the inheritance which I have caused, caused my people Israel to inherit. Now what did he inherit? The promise of the land, the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and eternal life. So we're talking about duality at this particular junction. It says, Behold, I will pluck them out of the land. I will pluck the house of Judah from among them. Verse 15, it shall come to pass, after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them, and to bring them again, every man to his inheritance, and every man to his land. See what God's saying? In every case, he's always bringing us back to where he wanted us to begin with, back to the land. See, but when we think about that on a weekly basis, because we live in a city, we never think about the land where God's bringing us to. All right, let's go to now. Um, back into Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Verse 7. Genesis 15 and verse 7. It says, And he said unto them, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit. And, and the Lord said, The Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take to me an heifer, three years old. And he goes through and he prepares the sacrifice for him. And let's pick it up into verse 13. And he said to Abram, Know of a surety that your seed shall be a sojourn in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and that shall afflict them four hundred years. And this is the promise that God gave to Abraham that because of Israel's sinning. This was before they came out of Egypt that they were going to go into a land that is not theirs. You and I live in the time where the land really is not God's. This land is being controlled by Satan. It's not ours. But God's saying that He's going to come back and He's going to recover His people out of this land. Just like He does here. He says, verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall come out again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that tells me something else about the, this that verse there. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. People, even in God's churches, think they can go about sinning and asking for forgiveness. Sinning, asking for forgiveness. Sinning, asking for forgiveness. Doing the same thing over and over and over again without ever trying to overcome that sin and saying, God knows me. This verse tells us that there's coming a time that God says He's cutting it off. And if you think you can do that for the rest of your life, you better think again. It's only through God's means He will make you change or you will be destroyed. When I say make you, you have free will. Don't, don't get me wrong there. But I'm saying bring, bring you to a point that you have to make a decision to change. And if you don't, he cut you off. Here he gave the Amorites four generations to make that change. It says the sins of the Amorites was not yet full. Now that's coming to the time in the New Testament. We look in Revelation where God says, you're going to go back to the land. It's coming to a time, he says, where he can hold back his anger no more. It's going to reach that point that God says enough is enough. And depending on where you are in your life, you will either make it or you will not be heard again. We need to understand that in God's church. We don't. We cannot go through our lives thinking that we can just get up on Saturday morning, go to church, and live the rest of our life, the rest of the week, any way we want to live. God is not going to have that. Because He's purifying everything back to its original state. And you and I need to do that every single day of our lives. That means we need to focus on our inheritance where we're going and focus on not this this, but what's coming. And a lot of people are having to make those choices right now because of jobs, because of homes, because of finances. And they're having to make tough decisions. So we need to be praying for them as they're going through that. Genesis chapter 17, just a chapter over, <clears throat> verse 6. It says, And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make, make of you nations, and kings shall come out of you. We know the story is that as these kings, they, they would come out. We know that eventually Jesus Christ, the king, the king of kings that came from that inheritance. 
um, chapter 17, verse 19. God said to, Abraham, to Sarah, said, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed for forever. So we can look back and we can look forward to know that that covenant relationship is going to be kept. It's not going to be ever stopped. Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Let me just go briefly through this chapter because it's very important. Talking about the Sabbath land rest. Leviticus chapter 25 and uh, beginning in verse 1. It says, the Lord, spoke, the, the Lord spoke to Moses in the Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying to them, That when you come to the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Isn't it amazing that even the land keeps the Sabbath? We live in a world that says you don't need to keep the Sabbath day. God's saying that not only do we need to keep it, but even the land's got to keep it. Now, how does the land keep a Sabbath day? Six years you shall sow your field. Six years you shall prune your vines and gather fruit thereof. But the seventh year you shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land. For the Sabbath of the Lord you shall neither sow in the field nor prune the vineyard. And that which grows of its own accord of the harvest you shall not reap. So even if something comes up and grows, you don't reap it. That was actually left for the sojourner and for the poor. And they would go out. And so the land would actually rest and regain its strength during that seventh year. So the Sabbath of the land shall, verse 6, be food for you, for the land for you, your servant, and for your maid, and for your high servant, and for your stranger and sojourners within, for the cattle, and for the beasts on the field, and shall all the priests be thereof. So I, I know farmers in the church. And what they would do is they would have certain different fields. And then they would rotate the field as well as rotating their stock. And then every seventh year, they'd have a certain field that wouldn't grow. And then the next year, this field wouldn't grow. And so they rotated the land to observe what God says so that they could be blessed. Let's go now to verse... Uh, uh, well, I was gonna, I'm not going to go there. But, but right down 23, Exodus 23, verses 1 through 12, is that... God gives you more reasons why he would let that land rest there also for helping the poor. And it was a way to do that, uh, that they were, they were taught. All right, let's go to now to um, Exodus 21. Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, verse 1. It says, These are the ordinances which you shall set before them, that if you buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, but in the seventh year he shall go out and be, and be free for nothing. Now here's, here's a situation like the land. That if you had poor in the land, let's suppose your family or whatever, and they couldn't make it, you actually sold yourself as a bond servant, as some people would call as a slave. But it actually was a bond servant to someone else. And they would serve their land, that, that person, for seven, six years on the seventh year they were free. However, if the seventh year rest, I think I've got it written down here, in Deuteronomy, we'll go there next. If it, for some reason the land and the, the person's rest of the, is called the time of being able to set free on that seventh year, if you sold yourself on the fifth year, you only served for two. And then there's a warning that God says, because he says, if you're greedy in your heart, and you know that that year is coming in, in next year, and you know that God needs some help and you don't do it, he says, I'm going to hold you accountable. Man, wouldn't it be interesting to have a society like that today? That when it's centered around the agricultural land, you know, there's, a, there's, there's land rest. That, a land rest doesn't always settle in the same time. But this rest did. And every seventh year was called the year of release. And everybody who was in, the, in that servitude would be released. When that's, and it would always come around the, the, uh, the time of uh, the atonement and right into the, the time of tabernacles. Let's go to we'll talk a little bit about that in Deuteronomy chapter 15. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 1. It says, At the end of every seven years you shall make a release. And in the same manner of the release, every creditor who lends anything unto his neighbor shall release it, and he shall not exact of his neighbor or his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. 
of a foreigner, you may exact it again. In other words, if a foreigner does it, then he, you can carry his debt out. You don't have to release him. But if it was a family member or, or someone Israelite, you had to release him. You didn't have any choice. Uh, verse 4, except when there shall be no poor among you, God says. Now that caught my that caught my eye. I said, well, except when there be no poor among you. But Jesus says the poor would always be among you. But if you go on reading in this chapter, verse 11, for the poor shall never cease. You know, God's, it was almost like it was, it was like, yeah, well, you can you can get away with it, and you don't have to release them if there isn't any poor. But there's always going to be poor, so you got to do it anyway. I thought that was pretty interesting the way God wrote that in there, because I read that scripture says, except when there be no poor. So when was that time there was no poor? Jesus said, the poor will always be with you. <laughs> Verse 11 says, the poor shall never cease from the land. All right. Look at verse 9, same chapter. That's what I was, I was warning you. See what God's getting to is your intent in your heart. Where you stand to help one another. Most people say, I'm not going to help you unless I can get something out of it. What's in it for me? That's usually the way it goes when you talk to people today. What's in it for me? So God's saying, verse 9, Beware that there be not a thought with your wicked heart saying, The seventh year in the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your brother that you give him nothing and he cry unto the Lord against you and it be a sin unto you. Wow. So here's a guy who needs some help. You don't help him because you ain't going to get nothing out of it. Not because you can't help, but there's nothing in it for you. God says, I'm holding you accountable. Now there's a New Testament scripture that says, he who knows to do good and doesn't do it to him is a sin. But what does that fall in the Ten Commandments? That's a pretty tough one, though. You know where it falls? First one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Because that's what God does with us. He gives us, and He don't really get anything out of it. He's building a family. He don't need us. He can do everything. He's got everything He needs. And His Son died for us. All right, so we're in that same intent. What God's trying to do here, He's trying to take people and put them back to the land to care for one another and to rebuild that land so that we can be a part when Jesus Christ comes back during that millennial reign to restore these things going back. Why? Because this is not what it's about. This land isn't what's in it for us. It isn't about a, a great job all the time. It's nice to have some money in your pocket and pay your bills. That's important. But if that's your only thing in this life and that's all you're ever going to get, then you've got your reward. What Abraham was telling us is that we can be in the middle of this land looking for that city, and it's not here. You know, I was blessed with the younger life being called. I was really, I, back then when I was young, I, I didn't think it was a blessing. I thought that was a curse. But, you know, hear about all this stuff? It's like, man, I ain't never going to have a decent life. Get stuck with this and stuck with that. Got to go to church on Saturday. Everybody hates me all the time. Man, what, what I have, did I have it filed up? And at the same time, I remember the job I was working, this greasy cable job. Splicing cable for these offshore oil rigs and the boats. I would be at break every two hours. You had to take a break because of the heat. I'd walk over to the to the door of that shop and I'd look up and I said, "There's got to be more to life than this." And at the same time, I'm being in a church and I'm saying, "There's got to be more than this." And so we talk between these two because I couldn't realize that what we're looking for isn't here. It's what Abraham said: "It's that city that's coming." And until you can focus your mind on the land that's coming, being a part of God and His 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 future, and helping those that need help as you're able to, as you are able to. Sometimes you just have to say, "I can't. I don't have anything. I'm not able to do that." And 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 God don't mean this. Let me make this clear because somebody will say, "Yeah, but if I give it to them, they're just going to throw it away and waste it like they always been doing." You got to be wis. You got to use wisdom when you're helping people too. In other words, you. You're not going to take give somebody who's an alcoholic that you know they're going to go down the street, just blow it on gambling and drinking, and give them a hundred bucks. You're just not going to do it. That's not what God's talking about here. He's talking about someone who's really striving to overcome the circumstance that they're in. If you can help them, you help them. See what I mean? There's a difference. You weigh it out. And sometimes people come to me in the church and say, we need some help. I will sit down and counsel them before I offer one penny from the church to say, what are you doing right now? For example, if a person didn't go to the feast last year, 
and they come into the church and they need help. First year out, they hadn't saved second time. They don't know about second times. We try to help them out. And you sit down and counsel them. Now, here's what God says. Next year, you start putting this money aside. You plan for it. Now, the next year, they say, well, we need help again. Now, wait a minute. You've had a year. What have you done? Well, I couldn't save anything because, well, why? Because, well, you you got these personal habits you can't overcome. You know, I'm paying $150 for cable because i got to have stars and i got to have HBO. You, know, you can't live with all that stuff out there. And you got all this special stuff on the Internet you got to have extra. Whereas you cut it off, could you go to the feast? You set your priorities. Now, would I help the person in the second year? No. And I feel like I'm within the law of God here in doing what's right to protect his inheritance, the ties, and things like that. Sometimes I'll get with some of the men and ladies in the church, and I'll say, look, I need some help with this. I can't make a good decision. I need some advice. And we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. Clayton shake his head. He knows that so many times I sat down in a, in a council meeting, God said there's safety in a multitude of council. Because God, I know if I don't help, and I can, I come under this edict, God says he's holding me accountable. Then on the other side, I'm also accountable if I waste. So there's a balance going on. And God brings us closer and closer. And we see that balance, how? In the land. If I over-fertilize the land, I burn it. And it's not going to grow. If I don't give it enough, then what happens is this, it starves. And you get to learn the color of the leaves. You see the veins into it, what is missing. It might need, it might need phosphorus. It could need a variety that could just need uh, nitrogen just to give it that quick jump. Maybe it's a green plant. It doesn't have fruit, so you can put more certain growth into it. So you weigh out all these things, and just like God with his people, you weigh them out to get the best it possibly be, could be. All right, let's move on now. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 31. You know, as I was going through the sermon, I said, this could be a really boring sermon. I said, you know, it's just talking about the land. They asked me what the title is, and I wrote the land down at first. I said, the land. Said, Who's ever going to want to watch that sermon that says, the land? I said, we need some punch into it. <laughs> so I told Danny and Jeff, if, if you find another title or a better title, I said, then I put our inheritance, the land. Said, well, that's better. Maybe somebody will look for it. But, you know, if it's going to an audience who has not been converted yet, you never know what's going to come across. But I think it's important. It's an important message because it's something we don't talk about very often. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. And Moses wrote, wrote this law, and he delivered it to the priests and the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years. And I thought this was interesting, because you see, all the laws that we've been going through, and a lot of them are in Deuteronomy, look what God told them they had to do every seven years. And it was built around the year of release. It says... Uh, at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles, they were required to read these laws. So, what did they, why did they do that? Because the people were free. So that they could go back and realize why they were free, that it didn't go to the person who freed them, it went to God who commanded the law to be. Because without that law... They weren't going to be released. If you don't believe me, look around today. We don't have that law. Try to go somewhere and say, well, listen, it's supposed to be like, it's been, it's been eight years, I still can't tell you. Why are you taking my land? You've owned a house for 12 years, you can't pay your note now because you just suddenly lost your job. Do you think that mortgage company is going to say, well, we'll let you go. We made enough money off you. <laughs> yeah, right, that's going to happen. That's not going to happen. So what God was going to show those people in the Feast of Tabernacles because they were there in the land that God gave them in this year of release, you're meeting here now, you're free of all that debt. And when you go home, they read what was important. Why? So they wouldn't get into that mess again. And then they can worship God. Really. And you know for the last few years, I, how hard I've been telling everybody, get out of debt. Make sure you get out of debt. Because time's coming, you're going to lose your home. And the more you can be out of debt, the less you owe, the better off you're going to be during the tough times that's coming. And they are coming quickly. 
I don't know how fast things will tumble, but they're going to tumble. They cannot overcome the situation they're in. It can't be done. They can talk about cutting this hundred million or that hundred million. But I showed you at the Feast of Tabernacles, in that one hour sermon, anywhere from 115 to 140 million dollars in debt every hour. You realize that? Every hour we increase our debt by 115 to 140 some more million dollars every hour. They can't cut enough debt. They can't cut they can't increase enough taxes to stop that. It's just not feasible. I'm going to tell you something else. The rest of the world knows it. Nobody's kidding themselves. The people who play with the big bucks, they know what's going on. They know it's coming. And it's only a matter of time. They are, the rest of this world is positioning themselves to take less of a fall when it happens. They know they're going to get hit. But what they're trying to do is stabilize themselves so when it comes, they can continue. We're going to see the time what God calls Jacob's trouble. If you're not out of debt, work to get out of debt. Work to get out of debt. It's important. It'll help you in the long run. This church may fill up with people who don't have a place to stay. God's people. We'll see how long how people get along with one another. All right, let's go on here. Where I'm at here in De Deuteronomy. All right, I, I was reading there in verse nine. See verse 10. Verse 11. It says, And when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord your God in the place which he shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. It says, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and the sojourners within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God to observe and do all these works of this law, and that their children who have, who have not known anything that may hear and learn the fear of the Lord as long as you live in the land and you go over the Jordan to possess it. It all deals with the land that they were dealing with. Now let's get ready to bring this to a close. I want to go into some of these. You can look at uh, Leviticus 25. It's called the Jubilee. Is that everything went back. You know, on the year of Jubilee, it's the 50th year. Every Jubilee, everything went back to its rightful owner. At the very end, uh, I will read that. Let's go to Leviticus 25. At the very end, Leviticus 25. How God sent us so much around the land. Leviticus 25, verse um, 23. It says this, For the land shall not be sold for forever, for the land is mine, and you are strangers and sojourners with me. So that all this land, it cannot be sold outright, it says. It's got to go back to the rightful owner on the year of Jubilee. That time's coming. It's a jubilee coming when this land will be returned back to the Heavenly Father. We can look at that in the New Testament in, in Revelation 22. We see the new heaven and the new earth coming. That's going to be a, a jubilee. I don't know that it'll be a final jubilee. I used to say the, the final jubilee, but the final jubilee as far as our understanding when a new heaven and new earth comes will be that time. It's in the 50th year. You had seven years of seven land Sabbaths, which brought us to 49 years. And then on the 50th year, they would sound that trumpet on the Day of Atonement. And all things would be brought back to its original owner. Satan was locked away. The land's been restored. You have to wonder, if going into the, uh, the, the millennial reign, if that year, the, that year, the millennial reign begins the Jubilee. You have to wonder, because if you go 50, 50, 50, 50, it says 1,000 years, it makes sense that if it's returned back to the Father, the 100 years after the millennial reign, which is 250s again, if it wouldn't be a, be a possibility of that being the Jubilee, or within 100 years of the time when finally all things are subdued, Christ is ruling, begins the Jubilee. Something to think about with the cause of land. But if you think about the land tied in with the future, it will open up so many possibilities of understanding that you've just never dreamed of before. Now, in closing, there's quite a number of scriptures I'd like to cover. There's just not enough time. I'd like to go to Hebrews chapter 4. 
Hebrews chapter 4. If you would write this scripture down while we're turning here, write down Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 6. It's talking about our preparation of the land to return it. Isaiah 61. I have Hebrews 4, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise be left to us of, of, uh, of entering into his rest, lest any of you should, should, come, should come short of it. For unto us the gospel was preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith for them that heard it. We're going to need that coming forward. As we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, the word preached needs to be mixed with faith because God's going to test us and try us to where we stand. Verse 3, So for we that believe do enter into a rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the word. For he spoke of a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, if they shall enter into my rest, the of God's rest, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter into it, and they to whom it was first preached enter not because of unbelief. And again, he limits in a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, pardon not your hearts. Now I'll close with that. If you've heard this word today, don't harden your heart against it. Take it in. Think about the land. Draw the analogies of what you see, how the land prospers and how it doesn't prosper. Tie it in with the duality, how it mixes in with God's people. And realize that we can't harden ourselves. In verse 9 it says, There remains therefore a rest to God's people of God. And for us there remains therefore a rest. Think about the land. Think about your inheritance. Because that city's coming. Let's hope we get we're a part of that city when it gets here.